Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on the 21st of November, the Holy Church commemorates the entrance of the Virgin Mary into the temple. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. In the hymns of, at Vespers of the feast we chant, Thou, O Virgin Mother of God, art she whom the prophets proclaimed, Thou art the glory of the, of the apostles and the pride of martyrs, the restoration of all who dwell on earth, for through thee we are reconciled with God. The feast of the entrance of the Virgin Mary into the temple is not among the most ancient festivals of the church. Nonetheless, it must have been instituted earlier than the 7th century, since St. Andrew of Crete, 660 740 had known about it. St. Tarasius, 806, the patriarch introduced it at Constantinople a century later. The festival blossomed forth from the tradition of the church, which made, a, made use of the apocryphal source, the Protoevangelium, in order to emphasize the fulfillment of the economy of the Creator and the self-consecration of the Chosen Virgin to a life in the service of God. The Church breaks the silence of the canonical Gospels that we may behold the incomprehensible ways of providence which prepared Mary, the receptacle of the Logos and the Mother predetermined before the ages. She who was preached by the prophets is now introduced into the Holy of Holies like a hidden treasure of the glory of God. God has sanctified all things by her entry and has made God like the fallen nature of mortal men. The Virgin Mary's Parents, the Righteous Joachim and Anna The Righteous Joachim and Anna, the Virgin's parents, had been married 50 years when they produced their much-desired offspring. Moreover, the elderly couple fully intended to dedicate and consecrate their offspring, male or female, to the temple and service of God. Thus, when the child reached two years of age, Joachim said to Anna, Let us take her up to the temple of the Lord, that she may pay the vow that we have made, lest the Lord should depart from us, or perchance the Lord send us someone to warn us that we have been too long in paying our vow, because our offering has not yet been received. But Anna said, Let us wait for her third year, so that our daughter might not be at a loss to know her father, and might not look for us. Therefore Joachim conceded and said, So let us wait. Much of both the poetic imagery and iconography of this feast, which are used liturgically, are derived from the following passage of the Proto-Evangelium. When the child reached her third birthday, Joachim said, Let us invite the daughters of the Hebrews that are virgins. Let each maiden take a lamp and stand with the lamps burning, that the child might not turn back, and then her mind would be set against the temple of the Lord. The Entrance into the Temple Thus her parents departed their home and went up to the temple with an escort of young maidens. Upon arriving, they then put off Mary's traveling clothes and arrayed her with garments that were neater and cleaner, indeed, clothes befitting a queen. Now there were fifteen steps at the temple that led from the court of the women to that of the men. The significance of the number fifteen to the Jews was that it corresponded to the fifteen psalms of degrees. The temple had been built on a mountain so that the altar of burnt offering could not be reached except by steps. On one of these steps they placed the little maiden Mary. Then the whole company ascended into the temple of the Lord, the maidens bearing lamps and singing psalms. And Mary, without anyone leading her or lifting her, ascended the steps, one after the other. The virgin's father, Joachim, was bright with joy and kept feast with Anna. Now Anna, truly blessed by God's grace, led with gladness into the temple of the Lord, the pure ever-virgin who is full of grace. And Anna called the young maidens to go before her, 
lamps in hand. Go, child, she said, to him who gave thee unto me. Be unto him an offering and a sweet-smelling incense. Go into the place that none may enter. Learn its mysteries and prepare thyself to become the pleasing and beautiful dwelling place of Jesus, who grants the world great mercy. Entering the temple with virginal glory, she is compared to that area of the temple known as the Holy of Holies. Thus in hymns we can hear St. Andrew of Crete chant, Thy wise parents, O undefiled one, brought thee who art the Holy of Holies as an offering to the house of the Lord there to be reared in holiness and made ready to become his mother. As that icon of the feast depicts, the righteous Joachim and Anna, rejoicing in spirit, offered their daughter in the temple of the law that she might make her dwelling therein. The virgins behind shall be borne away to the king. Those close to her shall be borne away to thee. They shall be borne away in gladness and rejoicing. They shall be led into the temple of of the king the words of the prophets are fulfilled the high priest Zacharias the husband of Anna's niece Elizabeth was the future father of st. John the Baptist when he beheld the virgins approach he rejoiced in the spirit and said Mary the Lord God has magnified thy name to all generations and by thee to the very end of time the Lord will show his redemption to the children of Israel. The high priest Zacharias unites in his person two traditions, priestly and prophetic. Rejoice Mary, preaching of the prophets and the fulfillment of their words. The prophets prophesied of thee and have thee as their boast. Jacob foresaw thee as the latter, Behold a ladder fixed on the earth, whose top reached to heaven, and the angels of God ascended and descended on it. Thus will the Lord desire to descend upon thee and become incarnate, and thereby men will be able to ascend to heaven. The golden urn of manna that Moses gave command to be laid up, so that future generations might see the bread with which the Hebrews were fed in the wilderness also prefigured thee. Thus thou wilt give flesh to the heavenly bread that will nourish the race of the anointed ones. The dry rod of Aaron was a sign of thee in that, without water it budded. In like manner wilt thou, without seed from man, virginally give birth to God. For this is his will. The fleece of Gideon prefigured thee. For as rain came down upon the fleece without anyone's knowledge, thus does God desire to condescend to put on flesh of thee, and not even the angels will understand how he would become incarnate. Let us, therefore, magnify the radiant cloud. The prophet David wrote, He shall come down like rain upon a fleece, like drops of water dripping upon the earth. The same prophet and king called thee queen, and uttered, on thy right did the queen stand by, having been clothed in a vesture interwoven with gold, having been embroidered with various colors. David the prophet, who is of thine own tribe, clearly foresaw and uttered, Hearken, O daughter, and behold, and incline thy e thine ear, and forget thine own people and the house of thy father, and the king shall desire thy beauty. Solomon remarked that thou art precious and honorable above all women, and said, Many daughters have obtained wealth, many have wrought valiantly, but thou hast exceeded, thou hast surpassed all. St. George of Nicomedia, after 880, here chants, Solomon, foreseeing how thou wast to receive God, spoke of thee in dark sayings, as the gate of the king and the living fountain sealed from which came forth untroubled waters unto us. Isaiah called thee virgin, and uttered, Behold, the virgin shall conceive in the womb, and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. Ezekiel forecalled the gate, and said, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no one shall pass through it. 
The gate spoken of by Ezekiel also foretells that just as the great king enters and exits, he will again close the gate. Thus the great king desires to be born. He will leave thee virgin just as thou art now. Daniel called the mountain when he said, A stone was cut out of a mountain without hands. The mountain beheld by Nebuchadnezzar and interpreted by Daniel also foreshadowed thee. The stone cut out of the mountain without human hands smote the image to powder. In like manner, without the will of man, the king of heaven and earth of his own will shall take flesh that he might shatter all the kingdoms of the world and proclaim the everlasting kingdom of heaven. Other types in the Old Testament of the Virgin Mother may be found in prophet Abacoam, who calls her the mountain overshadowed. The prophet Zacharias, in a vision, beheld the virgin as a gold seven-branched lampstand, with its spiritual light shining in the world. The high priest Zacharias then said, Enter the Holy of Holies, for thou art much purer than I. O mistress, once a year I enter therein, but thou sit and abide forever, for thou art the temple of God, therefore remain in the temple. Thou art the vessel of the Holy Spirit, enter thou into the elect place. Wait therein until thou art vouchsafed to be the worthy vessel of the all-Holy Spirit. Rejoice and sing, for angels desire to, to minister unto thee. The Virgin is Led Up then Zacharias turned to Mary's parents and said, O blessed and grace-filled couple, rejoice and be glad, for thou hast been vouchsafed to become the parents of such a daughter. You have surpassed our forefathers and fathers, in that you have given birth to the queen of the universe, and you will receive glory from God and men. This and many other things were uttered by Zacharias before both parents and their daughter. Then Anna spoke, Receive our daughter, O high priest. Indeed, much rather, let God receive her. Take her into the temple, for that is where she, the temple of God, must be and dwell. She is holy, and in a pure place she is to abide. Therefore, into the hands of God is she surrendered. O Zacharias, take my daughter and dedicate her to the temple, for this is what I vowed. The priest answered her, saying, Truly this work has been accomplished to full measure. I perceive that this is a thing wholly strange, for into the house of God I see her led, the one who wondrously surpasses the sanctuary in grace. Anna, filled with the Spirit, answered, Take her whom the prophets of God proclaimed in the Spirit, and lead her into the holy temple, there to be brought up in reverence, that she may become the divine throne of the master of all, his palace, his resting place, and his dwelling filled light. Zacharias then set her down upon the third step of the altar, and the Lord God sent grace upon her, and she danced with her feet, and all the house of Israel loved her. The virgin of the Lord then went up all the steps, one after another, without the help of any to lead or lift her. It was evident from henceforth that she was of perfect age because she walked with a step so mature and she spoke so perfectly. The church chants three years old in the flesh and many years old in spirit. Therefore, let us praise in hymns the child by nature who is shown forth as a mother beyond nature. The parents then, after offering up their sacrifice according to the custom of the law, left the virgin with other maidens in the apartments of the temple to be brought up therein. Mary's parents then went down, marveling and praising the Lord God, because the child did not turn back. They then returned to their home, and Mary was in the temple of the Lord as if she were a dove that dwelt there. For the next seven years, the parents of the virgin, little virgin visited her often until they reposed, leaving her an orphan. Bishop Nikolai Velimirovic wrote, 
records that the righteous Joachim was 80 years old and the venerable Anna was 79 years old when they reposed in peace. The Temple at Jerusalem In the words of St. Gregory Palamas, The Temple of Jerusalem was the type of Mary, for she is the true place of God. The prophet Ezekiel was told, Thou hast seen the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, in which my name shall dwell in the midst of the house of Israel forever. In the hymns of the feast we also see the analogy of the virgin and the temple with its holy vessels, as in the hymn of St. George the hymnographer. The law prefigured thee most gloriously as the tabernacle, the divine jar of manna, the wondrous ark, the veil of the temple, and the rod of Aaron, the temple never to be destroyed, and the gate of God. And so all these teach us to cry to thee, O pure virgin, thou art truly highly exalted above all. St. Cosmas, the poet, takes up this theme, comparing her to liturgical vessels and chants. Thy son, O virgin, has truly made thee dwell in the holy of holies, as a bright candlestick, flaming with immaterial fire, as a golden censer burning with divine coal, as the vessel of manna, the rod of Aaron, and the tablet written by God, as a holy ark and table of the bread of life. The Temple of Herod Herod the Great had attacked Jerusalem in 37 B.C., he was a prolific builder and decided to dismantle the old structure of the temple and rebuild it in the prevailing Hellenistic Roman style. This was probably a political gesture to reconcile the Jews. Work began in the year 2019 BC. Herod, taking pains to respect the sacred area, trained 1,000 priests as masons to build the shrine since only priests could enter the house and the inner court. Although the central part was completed within a year and a half, yet some of the subsidiary buildings were still under construction half a century later. At the age of three years and two and one-half months, the young Virgin Mary in all likelihood entered sometime shortly after the completion of the central part of the building, that is, at some time between 17 and 16 B.C. The temple building is described as exceedingly impressive in its grandeur of gleaming white marble, and it became one of the wonders of the ancient world. Now there was a thick curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Beyond it was empty space. The Ark of the Covenant in former days stood there, overshadowed by two cherubim of gold, whose wings touched each other and the side walls. Another feature was the rock of Moriah, which pierced the floor. Both the holy place and the holy of holies were paneled with cedar wood, and the floor was planked with cypress. Walls and double doors were decorated with carvings of flowers, palm trees, and cherubim overlaid with gold. There was no visible stonework inside. A heavy double veil concealed the entrance to the holy of holies. The most holy place, in Hebrew, Debur, was entered by the high priest once a year, namely on the Day of Atonement. Only the officiating priests were permitted to enter the larger room, the Hekol, to bring in the incense morning and evening, and to trim the lamp, which was done once a year and as we said, to replace the table with fresh showbread, which was done every Sabbath. The Ark of the Covenant The Ark of the Covenant was the most important object of peculiar sanctity. In the history of the Ark, it is expressly recognized as the leader of the Hebrew host in their exodus and march through the desert by virtue of its being, in some sense, the dwelling place of God. More so than any other object, the Ark is used to typify the Theotokos. In patristic times, the text, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the Ark of thy holiness, inspired much 
homiletic treatment. It is therefore fitting that the Virgin Mary, as in the case of the Ark when it was borne aloft by the Levites, should be borne by Anna, one of the daughters of Aaron, and even as in the time of David, and more so Solomon of the kingly tribe of Judah, who escorted the Ark to the temple. In like manner, Joachim of David's house escorts his daughter to the temple as the animate Ark. There was no ark in Herod's temple, but it did not matter because there was no need for the type when the living ark, Mary, was present in the Holy of Holies. St. Irenaeus writes, The ark is shown to be a type of the body of Christ, pure and undefiled. It was actually noted father of the church. It was actually the noted father of the church. Hippolytus of Rome, 172-36, who would identify the Virgin Mother with the Ark when he wrote, Now, the Lord was without stain, without sin, being in his human nature from incorruptible wood, that is, from the Virgin, and being sheathed, as it were, in the pure gold of the Logos within and of the Spirit without. Many other fathers will speak of Mary as the Ark. St. Proclus of Constantinople, in hymns, St. Romanos, St. Andrew of Crete, and St. John of Damascus. The Sacred Vessels Brief mention here now will be made of the sacred objects of the Jews. Liturgical vessels from the Old Testament are shown as prefigurative types of the Virgin Mother in both iconography and hymnology. hymnology. St. Gregory Palamas comments that she is the true throne of the Lord, for where the king sits, there is his throne. She is the receptacle of the treasure which God granted to men, and the tongs which the seraphim used to take up the live coal which touched the mouth of the prophet Elias, prefiguring the incarnation. St. Gregory chants, Thou candlestick with many lights, O bride of God, thou hast shone forth today in the house of the Lord, and thou dost illuminate us with the august gifts of thy grace and wonders, O pure and all-hymned Theotokos. The hymnographer St. Joseph, 810 chants, All of us honor thee, O virgin undefiled, as the shining lamp and candlestick, in which the fire of the Godhead came to dwell, bringing light to them held fast in the dark night of corruption. And we bless thy child-bearing, O blessed among women. The prophets proclaim thee in ages past, speaking of thee as the ark of his holiness, the golden censer, the candlestick, and the table. And we sing thy praises as the tabernacle that held God. St. Theodore the Studite, 759-826, also calls her a mercy seat. O Mary, called by God, truly thou art the mercy seat of the faithful. For through thee forgiveness is freely bestowed upon all. Cease not to intercede before the Son and Lord, gaining his precious favor for us who sing thy praises. St. Ambrose comments that the Ark of the, te the Testament is all covered with gold. This gold covering means the teaching of Christ, the teaching of the wisdom of God. There is the golden vessel containing manna, the vessel of spiritual nourishment, the storehouse of divine knowledge. There is the rod of Aaron, symbol of the grace of the priesthood. In the past it withered, but it has budded anew in Christ. There are the cherubim above the tablets of the Testament, the latter which are the knowledge of the Holy Scripture, there is the expiatory, the mercy seat, and high aloft is God, the Logos, the image of the invisible God, who says to you, I will speak to thee above the expiatory, between the two cherubs, which are upon the ark of testimony. The virgin enters the Holy of Holies. Then Zacharias, the priest of God, received her into the temple with rejoicing and established her there, that is, he then took Mary to the Bema. Thus she abode in the Holy of Holies for more than nine years. 
though some apocryphal manuscripts record her stay as being as long as 12 years. The Holy of Holies was a place that none dared enter except the high priest, and then only at his appointed time, and this happened but once a year. The Holy of Holies was the place in the temple, the dwelling place of God, in which God came into contact with man through the intermediary of the high priest. Now, God, who will condescend to become man, foreordained the Holy Virgin to become the supreme Holy of Holies, through which he would come into permanent contact with man in the Holy Church, becoming man himself, Christ Jesus, the, God, the great high priest and intermediary. As the Holy of Holies was filled with the glory of God's presence, so much that the priests could not bear the glory of it, so the womb of the All-Holy Virgin was to be filled with the glory of God's presence. The Virgin receives bread from the Archangel. St. George writes that the angels were astonished to see the Virgin enter the Holy of Holies. As we hear in the Festal Hymn, Beholding the entry of the All-Pure One, the angels were struck with amazement, seeing how the Virgin entered into the Holy of Holies. St. Andrew of Crete writes that Mary, the Holy of Holies, is placed as a toddler in the Holy Sanctuary to be reared by the hands of an angel. In the sacred hymns, we learn that the angel is the Archangel Gabriel. And Gabriel was then sent to thee, O Virgin, un all undefiled, to bring thee food. All the powers of heaven stood amazed, seeing the Holy Spirit dwell in thee. The manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which the Father purposed in Christ Jesus, had been led, hid in God. The principalities and powers in heavenly places knew it only in part. It was by and through the church that all came to know the mystery which, from the beginning of the world, had been hid in God. It is the secret preparation for the humanity of Christ. In the temple at Jerusalem, the elect virgin would prepare herself for her future role as the temple of his body, a body that would be destroyed, but that he would raise up in three days, and then with the same body he would be received up into the heavens and sit at the right of God. Moreover, she did not venture to leave this place, but remained therein and conversed with the angels. Her attitude is described by the hymnographer thus, O venerable holy of holies, thou dost love to dwell in the holy temple, and thou abidest, O virgin, in converse with angels, receiving bread most marvelously from heaven, O thou who dost sustain our life. St. Germanus of Constantinople, 635-733, in a sermon, presents a rich eulogy of Mary, fed by angels. The child grew and became strong, and the whole force of the curse by which we were struck in Eden was foiled. St. Gregory Palamas, in homily 37, writes, She passed not a few years in the Holy of Holies itself, wherein, under the care of an angel, she enjoyed ineffable nourishment, such as even Adam did not succeed in tasting. For indeed, if he had, like this immaculate one, he would not have fallen away from life. And so that she might prove to be his daughter, she yielded a little to nature, as would her son. He also comments that, While yet three years of age, and not yet possessing the super-celestial indwelling, Christ, she seemed not to bear our flesh as she dwelt in the holies of holy of holies here she became most perfect as regards her body by such great marvels again the virgin's role is emphasized when she is called the living bridal chamber she ch chamber we chant about her bridal role and mystical betrothal singing thou wast betrothed mystically through the spirit to be the bride of god the father Supernatural sustenance has occurred in other times and places to the saints of God. In the Old Testament, the Israelite nation was fed in the wilderness with the bread of the angels, with the bread of angels. Prophet Elias, the Thisbite, and the prophet Daniel, Bel and the dragon, 
were sustained by God's grace and fed by his messengers. After the coming of Christ, other recipients of this grace were the infant forerunner John, St. Paisius the Great, St. Mary Golinduk, and many other ascetics, both men and women, throughout the centuries. The Virgin Growing Up in the Temple St. John Maximovich writes that Mary was settled in the quarters for virgins which existed in the temple. She spent so much time in prayer in the Holy of Holies that one might say that she lived in it. She desired to fulfill the commandment of God, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Thus she became more and more perfected in the work of God. Far from the turmoil of daily life, she meditated on God and nourished her soul on Scripture day and night. She ate once daily and occupied herself with prayer and wool work. When the, other vir when the older virgins rested from the praises of God, she did not rest. None exceeded her in the praises and vigils of God, and no one was more learned in the wisdom of the law of God. No one was more lowly in humility, more elegant in singing, and more perfect in all virtue. St. Ambrose comments in concerning the ever-virginity of the Virgin Mary, that she was adorned with all virtue and manifested an example of an extraordinarily pure life. Being submissive and obedient to all, she offended no one and was cordial to all. She never spoke a crude word and did not allow any unclean thought. Mary blessed God without interruption and lest perchance even in greeting others she should cease from her praises to the Lord. She even answered then, praising God in her salutation, by saying, Thanks be to God, or Glory be to God. From the Virgin began the custom of using this expression when people greet one another. The sojourn of the Virgin Mary in the temple is described by St. Gregory Palamas in terms that make Mary the model of the hesychastic life. Extolling constant prayer, the saint indicates that the Virgin was the first to take it up herself to pray unceasingly. Her asceticism therein, according to St. Gregory, had not led her to come to an understanding of the grace received from the time of her conception, but rather had led her to learn more of the nature of the sins of Adam. It was there that she perceived and recognized that no one could halt the murderous rush which was bearing away the human race. Thus she was filled with pity for people who were brought to ruin and condemnation through disobedience. Therefore, she resolved to have her heart, mind, and soul dwell on God, and endeavored to remain attentive and struggle in prayer. She would pray for the human race and God's great mercy. She understood the most excellent way to converse with God was through holy silence and silence of the mind. Hence, she withdrew from the world and put away all earthly things. Through this, by God's grace, she ascended to contemplation of Him. Thus the, virgins pion thus the virgin pioneered a new path to God by the path of silencing the thoughts, abiding in prayer day and night, and maintaining silence. She cleansed her heart and was inexpressibly united with him. Rising above all creation and creatures, the All-Holy Virgin contemplated God's glory more fully than did Moses, and communed of divine grace in such a way that defies words and even reason. She became a luminous cloud of living water, the dawn of the unspeakable day, and the fiery chariot of the Logos. There, in the Holy of Holies, through prayer of the heart, she ascended to the summit of contemplation, renouncing the world for the world's sake, by holy silence and attentive inner prayer. She would serve as a model for those future monastics of her Son and God. As we mentioned earlier, the young Virgin Mary gave herself up entirely to God and repulsed from herself every impulse to sin. 
Yet still she felt the weakness of human nature more powerfully than others. Therefore she greatly desired the coming of the Savior. St. Ephraim the Syrian, 306-373, chants that women heard that a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son. Honorable woman hoped that thou, O Christ, would rise from them. Yea, noble ladies hoped that thou mightest spring up from them. Blessed be thy, majest thy majesty that humbled itself and rose from the poor. In her humility, which showed her great spiritual height, Mary considered herself unworthy to even be the servant girl of the queen mother or, or virgin, prophesied by Isaiah, who was to give birth to the Messiah. Nevertheless, Mary alone, being God-inspired, dedicated her virginity to the Lord, not consciously aware that what was meant in the prophecy was that a consecrated virgin would give birth, not a virgin who would conceive after marriage by her husband's seed. St. John Damascus, 676-750, agreeing with this account of her formative years, wrote that when she grew up in the house of God, nourished by the Spirit, like a fruitful olive tree, she became an abode of every virtue, turning her mind away from every worldly and carnal desire. This was fitting for one who was to conceive God within herself. She kept her soul and body virginal, for he is holy and finds rest among the holy. Therefore, she sought and strived after holiness and was shown to be holy and a wondrous temple for the Most High God. St. Gregory Palamas praises Mary in superlative terms. Today, a new world and a wonderful paradise have appeared. In it and from it, a new Adam is born to reform the old Adam and renew the whole world. God has kept this virgin for himself before all ages. He chose her from among all generations and bestowed on her grace higher than that given to all others, making her, before her wondrous childbirth, the saint of saints, giving her the honor of his own house and the holy of holies, wishing to create an image of absolute beauty and to manifest clearly to angels and to men the power of his art. God made Mary truly all beautiful. He made of her a blend of all divine, angelic, and human perfection, a sublime beauty embellishing the two worlds, rising from earth to heaven and surpassing even this latter. St. Joseph, the hymnographer, writes, The Holy Spirit wholly sanctified thee in the temple, Therefore thou hast become the fair spouse of the Father and the Mother of the Son. Through the intercessions of thy saints, O Christ God, have mercy on us. Amen.